Hello and welcome to GD Live at PALS. Um, this is part two of the GD Science Practice Test 3 here on our YouTube channel. Um, before we start, um, again, if you find our videos helpful and they help you in preparing for your GD tests, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel because this will help us to reach more people like you who want to prepare for their GD tests. So, yeah, if you like it, subscribe, hit the bell to miss uh, no other videos to help you preparing. And um, yeah, let's continue with our part two. If you haven't watched part one yet, uh, you can do that. It's not necessary. Um, we will now continue with question number 13. Touch sensors of nerves adapt to some degree after they have been stimulated for a period of time. Um, on the first touch, a very high impulse rate of nerve signals is sent to the brain, but the rate then slows until some sensors stop responding altogether. Which of the following is an example of the nerve touch sensor slowing down? A person is wearing eyeglasses but doesn't feel them. A person has a cut that heals quickly. A person gets a bruise that hurts at the touch. A person gets very sunburned and turns red. So which questions or which answers, sorry, which answers can we exclude here? So the question is obviously about touch, touch sensors that will uh, adapt to some degree. Um, so which answer is not about touch sensors necessarily? That is answer D. The person gets very sunburned and turns red. That has nothing to do with touch sensors. For sure the sunburn will uh, hurt uh, when it gets touched, but again, doesn't mention that either. So we definitely can exclude D here. Doesn't have to do anything with touch sensors. Uh, same with B. Has a cut, heals quickly. No touch sensors involved here. So it's either A or C. A person gets a bruise that hurts at the touch or a person is wearing eyeglasses but doesn't feel them. Um, so the question is about touch sensors uh, adapting to some degree after they have been stimulated for a long period of time. Which means, um, yeah, and basically, okay, so on the first touch, a very high impulse rate of nerve signals is sent to the brain, but the rate then slows until some sensors stop responding altogether. If sensors are not responding anymore, um, there yeah, is no feeling of touch anymore. And the best answer that works here is answer A, wearing eyeglasses. Uh, if you do wear eyeglasses or sunglasses sometime, um, yeah, you might know that after some time. You don't really feel them anymore, anymore sitting on your nose because your touch sensors have adapted to that continuous uh, stimulus and then they stop responding. C, uh, it says hurts at the touch, so here the touch sensors are responding. 14 and 15 are based on the paragraph. The basic unit of structure and function of living things is the cell. A group of specialized cells of the same type works together to form a tissue. Tissues work together to form an organ. Organs work together to form an organ system. Complete the system work together to form a multicellular organism. Complete systems work together to form a multicellular organism. Okay. According to this organizational description, what is an eye? Uh, an eye, cell, tissue, organ, or organ system. The correct answer here is that the eye is an organ. The eye is made of several tissues that work together to perform a specific function. Um, which of the following has the most complex level of organization? Frog's stomach, an elephant's ear, a human cell, a whale's digestive system. Um, yeah, here we can classify these. A frog's stomach is an organ, an elephant's ear is an organ as well, a human cell. Here we are on the cellular level, the lowest level of organization. A whale's digestive system is an organ system, so D is the correct answer, the digestive system. Question 16 is based on the illustration below. Uh, we see mitosis here, the four phases of mitosis, prophase, step two, metaphase below, we go from top to bottom and then 
drop left and down again. So step one, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. We can see what's happening here. Again, we are inside a cell here. Uh, during cell division, we can see the DNA condensing to chromosomes, chromosomes getting aligned on the equatorial plate by the centrioles and the microtubules, the mitotic spindle. Here we can see the sister chromatids getting pulled apart and we can see during telophase the chromosomes have uh, decondensed have, and the cell is going into cytokinesis, the actual division of the cytoplasm. Which of the following best uh, describes anaphase? Chromatin and the cells, cell nucleus are contained within the cell membrane. Chromosomes line up, forming a spindle fiber, forming the center of the nucleus. Chromosomes separate and move apart on spindle fibers. Two nuclei and nuclear membranes form, cell divides, and two daughter cells form. So we can see anaphase is here. What happens during anaphase? The chromosomes get pulled apart and move along the spindle fibers. So C is the correct answer here. Chromosomes separate and move apart on the spindle fibers. 17. A student wants to investigate the effect of light intensity on growth rate of plants. Light intensity is the controlled variable, independent variable, dependent variable, or the controlled group. So every experiment uh, in terms of variables has these three types of variables, independent, dependent, and controlled. Independent, we usually have one. One, var one variable that is the independent, then there is one variable usually, which is the dependent variable, and controlled variable uh, are usually several, but the more the better. And yeah, so what exactly uh, are these variables? So the independent variable is the variable that we change on purpose in an experiment because we want to investigate uh, the effect that it has on the dependent variables. The dependent variable is the variable in the end that we measure during our experiment or after the experiment, the data that we collect, that's the dependent variable. Um, the controlled variables are all the other things that we usually, yeah, that we want to keep the same all the time for all our experimental groups during the experiment to exclude their um, to exclude them from actually affecting the dependent variable. So what we want is only the independent variable having an effect on the dependent variable, everything else we want to keep constant. Control group in the end uh, is more for the experimental design. We have experimental groups and a control group. Um, yeah, let's, let me just do, go over an example here using this question. Uh, the effect of light intensity, the correct answer here would be uh, B. Uh, the light intensity is the independent variable. We want to measure its effect. So we will change the light intensity in different experimental groups. And the growth rate is what we measure. We will measure the plant's growth after a couple of days or so every day once. And um, yeah, we will expect probably different growth rates for different light intensities. And we could then formulate a hypothesis, which is a prediction based on our background knowledge that we have or that we have acquired before we planned our uh, experiment, before we came up with our hypothesis. And obviously a reasonable hypothesis here would be the higher the light intensity, uh, the higher the growth rate or the faster the growth rate of the plants. So we can see light intensity and we assume that light intensity affects the growth rate. Obviously, other things, if we want to investigate that and be sure about our conclusion, we should keep things like uh, the type of plant that we use for the different uh, light intensities the same. We should give all the plants the same amount of water. The plants should grow in the same types of uh, the same type of soil um, in the same pots um, and so on. So these are all things that we keep the same during the experiments. They don't affect the growth, and these are all controlled variables. All right. 
question 18. What part of a cell contains the genetic material and controls its process? That should be easy. Um, take a quick pause the video. Uh, the answer comes now. The correct answer here is the nucleus B. Nucleus contains the genetic material. Um, what part of a cell is a protective barrier and controls what substances move in and out of a cell? Again, you can pause if you want to think about it here. That should be pretty straightforward. The correct answer is the cell membrane. The cell membrane controls what moves in and out. Cell wall we find only in plant cells and cell wall gives uh, strength to the plant cells. So behind the cell wall, um, plant cells have as well a cell membrane. So the cell membrane is the structure that controls the inflow and outflow of substances. So wall uh, is permeable, so all kinds of dissolved substances can diffuse through it, can move through it. So wall doesn't control movement of anything. It just gives stability to the plant cell. Okay, here we have a bit more to read. Question 20 to 24. So five questions are based on the following paragraph and table. Simple machines make work easier usually by reducing the applied force necessary at the expense of the distance over which that force is applied. The six types of simple machines are listed in the following table. Inclined plane. Flat surface placed at an angle load can be pushed or rolled up or down. Example is a ramp. A lever. Uh, a board or bar that pivots on a support called fulcrum. Load is moved by applying force to part of the lever, example a seesaw. A pulley is a rope wrapped around one or more wheels. Load can be attached to rope or wheel and lifted, for example crane. An inclined plane wrapped around a lever is a screw. Um, during a sc Turning a screw causes it to move up or down. A wedge is an inclined plane that moves. A wedge is used to split objects, for example, an axe. A wheel and axle, the wheel uh, with a rod through it, that's a wheel and axle. A load can be attached to the axle and moved, for example, a doorknob. Uh, simple machines can also change the amount of force you need to apply. If the amount of force that comes out of a machine, the output force is greater than the amount of force you apply to the machine, the input force, then the machine is said to amplify the force. A machine's mechanical advantage tells you how much the machine multiplies the input force. Uh, think about word equation, work equals force times distance. Remember that simple machines cannot change the total amount of work done. If you want to reduce the amount of input force, there must be a trade-off. To do the same amount of work using less force, the distance traveled must increase. Power is the amount of work a machine can do in a certain amount of time. The faster a machine performs work, the greater is its power. The machine's power can be calculated by dividing the amount of work it does by the amount of time in which it performs the work. The power equation is as follows. Power is equals work divided by time. Connect with lines, the type of simple machine with the correct item. Some names will not be used. A slide is probably the same as a ramp in our example, so a slide should be an inclined plane. A twisted twist top lid and jar, not like a jam jar or something like this, or a honey jar where you twist the top and it opens. <coughs> What do we have here? That sounds pretty much like a screw, I guess. A screw and inclined plane wrapped around a lever. That sounds good. A hammer. Hammer, hammer. What do we have here? Oh, that's actually tricky. Uh, hammer, well, it depends on what we do. Oh, well, okay, if, if, if we think about it, okay, then it would be the nail. So if we hammer a nail into the wall, the nail itself uh, would be a wedge, but they don't ask for the nail, they ask for the hammer. Um, 
so if we use the hammer to hammer a nail in it could be seen as a lever however not a lever as it is described in the table um, or it could be used I don't know it could actually be used as a lever eventually to pull out a nail for example no, that would definitely be used as a lever so I would go for lever here with a hammer if you use a hammer you use it as a lever as well if you swing the hammer basically it's, it's a lever um, the paint roller is definitely the wheel and axle and we have the paint roll on the outside and the axle on the inside around it around which it rotates Twenty one complete the statement using an amount based on the information in the section. A simple machine that requires half the input force requires you to travel. Ah, okay, so what kind of distance do we need to travel when the input force is half of the output force? So we learn up here since the amount of work done in a system. Uh, so the amount of work done by the input force is the same as the amount of work done by the output force. Since work done is force by distance, that means when the input force is half of the force uh, of the output force, that means that the distance traveled must be double. So we travel double the distance. Um, mechanical advantage MA can be calculated by using the formula shown. Mechanical advantage equals output force divided by input force. The crate required 900 newtons of force to lift. The crate was lifted by a forklift with an engine that provided 225 newtons of force. What is the mechanical advantage of the forklift? Okay, so the uh, important bits that we need to figure out here is what's the input force, what's the output force. You use a forklift to lift the crate and you want to lift the crate. So have a quick think. Uh, what's the input force, what's the output force. So the input force in this case are the 225 newtons of force that are put in by the forklift to lift the 900 newton uh, box or crate which is the output force so we have 900 divided by 225 and that is 4 900 divided by 225 is 4 so the correct answer here is 4 so what does that mean a me mechanical advantage of 4 that means that you need four times less force. Uh, you use four times less force um, with your simple machine. Uh, then, yeah, comes out in the end. So the force that you put in is amplified by a factor of four. The output force is going to be four times bigger than the force that you put in. Uh, a 5,000 Newton block is lifted 10 meters. How much work is done? Um, work is measured in joules, by the way. Uh, so we're we looking for the work done, 5,000 Newton. We have the formula up here. Work equals force times distance. So 5,000 times 10 is 50,000 joules. The 5,000 Newton block is lifted 20 meters over a period of 10 seconds by a crane. What is the effective power of the crane? So uh, power is work divided by time. We don't know the work yet, so we need to calculate the work done first. Again, with force times distance, which is 5,000 times 20, which in this case is... Uh, 100,000 joules. And then we divide that by 10, we divide by time, 10 seconds, hundreds of thousand divided by 10 is 10,000. The correct answer is C, 10,000 watts. 
25 to 28 are based on the following information and table. Titration is the slow addition of one solution of known concentration, called the titrant, to a known volume of another solution of unknown concentration, until the reaction reaches neutralization, which is often indicated by a color change of an added indicator. In a broad sense, titration is a technique to determine the concentration of an unknown solution. One of the most common forms of titration is acid-base titration. Acid-base titrations are usually used to find the amount of a known acid or basic substance through acid-base reactions. The analyte is the solution with an unknown concentration. The reagent is the solution with a known concentration that will react with the analyte. A student conducted a titration experiment to determine the concentration in mole per decimeter cube molar of acetic acid in a vinegar sample. She performs five trials to determine the value of the uh, molarity, her experimental of the concentration. Her experimental values uh, of concentration are recorded in the table below. What is the mean value of the concentration in the conducted experiment? So how do we do that? We add, how do we find the mean? Uh, we take the sum of all the uh, data points that we have, of all the numbers, and we divide it by the total number of numbers that we have added up. So what we need to do here is we need to add these five numbers, 0 0.08 plus 0 Point 0.1 and, th and so on, and then we divide it by 5. So you can put that into your calculator, you can pause the video if you want to. Um, let's see. Okay, so I don't have a calculator right here right now, um, but what we can see is that if we add these two, well, okay, these two are 0 0.1. If we look at trial 3 and 4, this one is 0 0.005 off of 0 0.1 below, and this one is 0 0.005 above. So we, if we take the mean of these two, we get to 0 0.1 as well. So we've basically tried two of trial 2, 3, 4, and 5, the mean would be 0 0.1. But now we have trial 1 as well, which is below that. So the only value that makes sense here is C, 0 0.098, which should be slightly below 0 0.1. So the correct answer is C. Uh, 26, in this titration experiment, acetic acid is V. Uh, indicator, analyte, titrant, reagent. Okay, uh, that's quite interesting. That is definitely a reading comprehension question here. So um, which ones can we exclude uh, if you want to read the text again, you can pause the video now and try to answer the question. Um, I will go ahead now. So uh, the answer that we can definitely exclude here is A, the indicator. The indicator, as uh, stated somewhere, um, is the substance that changes color here, no? changes color. Uh, to tell us when we reach uh, the point of neutralization, when the reaction is finished, basically. So it's definitely not that. So it's either the analyte, titrant, or reagent. Um, so up here we see... Okay, titrant, we get in information about the titrant here. Titration is the slow addition of one solution of known concentration. So the titrant is the substance of known concentration. Let's see what acetic acid is in our experiment. Uh, a student conducted a titration experiment to determine the concentration of acetic acid. So we don't know the concentration of acetic acid and we want to find out what concentration it has. So up here it says the titrant is uh, the substance of known concentration. So we can exclude the titrant. It's not the titrant because the acetic acid, we don't know the concentration. So it's either analyte or reagent. Let's see what the text has to say about analyte or an and reagent. I guess that's the second paragraph. 
The analyte is the solution with an unknown concentration. So answer B should be the correct answer. Um, the reagent is the solution with a known concentration that will react with the analyte. Yes. Uh, so titrant and reagent are basically the same thing, just different terms for the same thing. Um, the analyte is the substance of unknown concentration, in this case, the acetic acid in a vinegar sample. So correct answer for 26 is B. 27. What type of chemical reaction happens in this experiment? Endothermic reaction, uh, combustion reaction, neutralization reaction, and decomposition reaction. I think this is stated in the text as well. This is a neutralization reaction. How is so the other types of reactions are endothermic. Endothermic uh, is a reaction that absorbs energy from its surrounding. The opposite would be an exothermic reaction, which is not an answer option here because exothermic reaction, uh, if you know a little bit about chemical reactions um, and neutralization, then you know that neutralization reactions are exothermic reactions. So if exothermic was an option here, then we would have two correct answer choices. So neutralization reactions, especially between acids and bases, are usually exothermic. So endothermic is the opposite. An endothermic reaction absorbs energy from the surrounding, so it cools the surrounding down, whereas an exothermic reaction releases energy to the surrounding. Like a fire, for example, when uh, wood is burning, the organic compounds in the wood, they react with oxygen, and uh, that releases heat. The fire that we see heat and light energy and that is an exothermic reaction now what do we call it uh, in chemical terms when a fuel like wood is burning in oxygen that is a combustion reaction so it's not a b either which says combustion a decomposition reaction is a reaction where we have one reactant that breaks down into two or more smaller more simple Reactants. Since we have two reactants here, acid and base, that react to form salt and water, it is not a decomposition reaction. So it's a neutralization reaction. 28. How is the student able to determine when the reaction is finished and stop the titration? An indicator is added to the solution that will change color when the reaction is completed. The color will change automatically when the acid is neutralized. The student knows when to stop the titration. The solution will start bubbling when the titration is finished. So only one answer really makes sense here. Um, again, it's related to the text. To, until the reaction is finished, which is often indicated by a color change of an added indicator. So we know that the point of neutralization is reached when the indicator is changing color. So the correct answer here is A. Twenty-nine. Photosynthesis is a reaction where carbon dioxide is reacted with water uh, with the help of the energy of sunlight. Glucose, one of the products, contains a much higher amount of chemical potential energy than the reactants. Photosynthesis is, is an example of a endothermic reaction, exothermic reaction, imbalanced reaction, a displacement reaction. So again, we have types of reactions here. Um, if you paid attention during the last question and its discussion, um, here we are told that the photosynthesis reaction is a reaction uh, yeah, where carbon dioxide is reacted with water to help with the help of the energy from sunlight. So sunlight energy is used in that chemical reaction to produce glucose, which contains much higher amounts of chemical potential energy than the reactants. This tells us that in this reaction, the reaction absorbs energy from its surroundings, specifically light energy in this case, and it puts that into the chemical energy of its products. So in an endothermic reaction, the chemical products have higher amounts of energy than the chemical reactants. They get this amount of energy from the surrounding, which usually cools down. In an exothermic reaction, the uh, 
uh, reactants have more energy, they will lose energy to the surrounding, the surrounding heats up and the products have less energy, chemical energy than the initial reactants. 30. How many total atoms of hydrogen are in one molecule, uh, each of H2O and C6H12O6 glucose? Total atoms of hydrogen each, so H2 we have 2 and H12, there are 12, so 2 plus 12 is 14. D. Balance the, the following chemical reaction. S8 plus how many F2s gives how many SF6s. So, how do we do that? On the right side we have SF6. Um, so first of all, when we balance equations, we see we already have the blanks here. Uh, we are not allowed to change the subscripts, the small numbers. Uh, these are already the correct formulas for the substances that are given here. So we are only allowed to change the coefficients in front, the big numbers, and the total number of atoms will be basically the coefficient in front times the uh, subscript of the individual elements and the compounds. So we see here we have 8 sulfur in S8, 1 times 8 is 8. Um, if we don't have a coefficient in front, that usually means 1. So we have 1 S8 at the moment, so we have 8 sulfur atoms on the left side. The moment we have 1 times 2 fluorine atoms on the left side as well. So 8 sulfur, 2 fluorine on the right side, we have 1 sulfur and 6 fluorine. So the first thing that we balance uh, are the number of sulfur atoms. We have 8 here, we have only 1 here. So what times 1 gives 8? Eight? 8 times 1 gives 8. So we need to write an 8 in front of the SF6. If we have 8 SF6, how many fluorines do we have on the right side now? That means the coefficient 8 times 6. 8 times 6 uh, is 48. So we have 48 fluorine atoms on the right side. To get to 48 with F2, 2 times what is 48? 2 times 24 is 48. So the coefficient of fluorine is going to be 24 and the coefficient of SF6 is going to be 8. So the correct answer is B, 24, 8. Name the type of the following reaction. Uh, so what type of reaction is that? 2H2O2 gives 2H2O plus O2. We can see we have one reactant on the left side that forms two products. I mentioned that earlier as well. If you paid attention, this is a so-called decomposition reaction. To decompose means to break down. The opposite of a decomposition reaction is this reaction would go the other way around to reactants forming one product. That would be a synthesis reaction. To synthesize means to build, to make, to produce. So two important key terms that are really helpful to know uh, when it comes to the GED science test. Decomposing means to break down, to synthesize means to build up, to make, to produce. So a decomposition reaction, we have one reactant that breaks down into two or more simpler products. The synthesis reaction would be the opposite, two or more simple uh, molecules combined to form one more complex molecule. Um, uh, single replacement reaction combustion. Uh, these are not the case here. So the correct answer is A, decomposition. Question 33 to 35. States of matter, uh, solid, liquid and gas, are the three main states of matter. The molecules in solid are held together by very strong bonds. Therefore, they have the most um, densely packed, slowest moving particles. Gas molecules, on the other hand, are held together by weak bonds. So gases have the least densely packed, fast-moving particles. Matter can undergo physical changes to convert uh, from one phase to another. Down here we see a phase diagram and the phase changes. Um, exothermic and endothermic processes. Okay, important here. Exothermic and endothermic processes, not reactions. In an exothermic process, heat is released and bonds are formed. During an endothermic process, heat is absorbed and bonds are broken. 
um, which of these processes results in a substance with slower moving molecules and stronger attraction between molecules. So we slow the molecules down. What information do we get on the left side? Uh, solids, very strong bonds, therefore they have the most densely packed, slowest moving particles. Gas have the fastest moving particles. So during what process are molecules slowing down? So we have to go somewhere from, in this diagram basically, from right to left. Because solids have the slowest moving particles, like gases have the fastest moving particles. We want to slow particles down. So it has to go somewhere from gas to what solid. Um, let's see what we have here. Melting goes from left to right, solid to liquid. Sublimation goes from left to right as well, solid to gas. Freezing goes from right to left. That's probably the correct answer. Depo Deposition goes from left to right as well. Question is, which is the most endothermic? Uh, the most endothermic will be deposition because we go from all the way gas to all the way solid, whereas freezing only goes from liquid to solid. So the correct answer is D, deposition. Uh, 35. Dry ice or solid carbon dioxide is used for special effects in movies as shown. No? Okay, here's no picture for that. The dry ice is used to create white fog or smoke. Uh, what change of state does carbon dioxide undergo in this situation? So we have dry ice, which is solid carbon dioxide. Dioxide is used. Ah, okay, it's used for special effects uh, in movies and shows, TV shows. The dry ice is used to create white fog or smoke. So we go from solid carbon dioxide to fog or smoke which is obviously a gas vapor so we have to go from solid all the way to gas and this is called sublimation is that an answer option yes the correct answer is c sublimation 36 to 38 the cohesive attractive forces between liquid molecules are responsible for the phenomenon known as surface tension the molecules at the surface of a glass or water do not have other water molecules on all sides of them and consequently they cohese more strongly uh, to those directly associated with them. Oh, here we can see the two arrows. Uh, in this case next to and below them but not above. It is not really true that a skin forms on the water surface. The stronger cohesive cohesion between the water molecules as opposed to the attraction of the water molecules to the air makes it more difficult to move an object through the surface uh, than to move it when it is completely submerged. The Giza forces between molecules in a liquid are shared with all the neighboring molecules. Those in the surface have no neighboring molecules above and thus exhibit stronger attractive forces upon their nearest neighbors and on, uh, on and below the surface the nearest neighbors on and below the surface. Okay, Surface tension could be defined as the property of the surface of a liquid that allows it to resist an external force due to the cohesive nature of the water molecules. Uh, water molecules want to cling to each other. Uh, at the surface, however, there are fewer water molecules to cling to since there is air above. There's no water molecules. This results in a stronger bond between those molecules that actually do come in contact with one another and a layer of strongly bonded water, back in the diagram, um, this surface layer held together by surface tension creates a considerable barrier between the atmosphere and the water. In fact, other than mercury, water is has the greatest surface tension a liquid okay so these three paragraphs more or less tell us the same thing it tells us that surface tension is a result of uh, the water molecules on the surface having less uh, water molecules to cling to compared to the water molecules below them so they cling to their neighbors more strongly um, which of the examples best illustrates surface tension? Some objects are able to float in water, some small insects can walk on top of the water, 
Ice is less dense than liquid water. Water is able to erode rocks and other surfaces. Um, so which ones can we exclude here? You can pause the video now to answer these three questions on your own and then resume. So I will go into the discussion now. Um, C and D don't really make sense here. Ice is less dense than liquid. We are not talking about density. Water is able to erode rocks and other surfaces. Uh, okay, so a bit confusing maybe because the term surfaces comes up here. But uh, again, this text has nothing to do with erosion of rocks or other things. So it's either A or B. Some small insects can walk on top of the water. That sounds very good. Some objects are able to float in water. And something floated usually has broken the surface tension. Uh, so floating has to do with something else, has to do with buoyancy. Um, but a water strider, for example, that is able to walk on water, uh, these insects are able to do that because of the surface tension of the water. So correct answer is B. Which of the following has the highest level of surface tension? Water, alcohol, gas, and eat mercury. Um, okay, that is a reading comprehension question here. At the very end, we are told that, uh, in fact, other than mercury, water has the greatest surface tension, which means that Mercury is one of is the substance that has a greater surface tension than water. Otherwise, water has the greatest surface tension. So mercury is the correct answer. Mercury has greater surface tension than water. The water molecules below the surface, below the surface, not on top of the surface, below the surface, form equal bonds with all of the other water molecules they contact. Form stronger bonds with those molecules next to them than with those below them, are unable to form bonds with water molecules on the surface, are smaller than water molecules on the surface. Okay, which ones can we exclude? Definitely D, size of water molecules, nothing was mentioned about that, um, are unable to form bonds with water molecules on the surface, so we're talking about water molecules down here, we can see they do form bonds with water molecules on the surface. Uh, B form stronger bonds with those molecules next to them than with those molecules below them. Again, we are talking about water molecules below the surface. So we're talking about the second two rows. We can see they form the of equal strength bonds, bonds to water molecules next to them. Form equal bonds with all of the water molecules they're in contact with. Yes, that's what they do. Can see that here in this diagram. So correct answer is A. The graph shows the consumption of generated electricity in the US over 62 years by major generating sources. Consumption of electricity uh, generation by major sources from 49 to 2011 uh, quadrillion um, BTU. And we can see that coal is rising, 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 going up from 1950 to 2011, and then just falling in the last few years a little bit. We can see that renewable energies are more or less stable until, yeah, more or less stable, tiny bit of rise. Natural gas, the light one, rises a little bit until 1970s, stays stable and then rises again from 1990 to 2011. Nuclear power uh, was developed in the 60s, so just starts rising in the 70s and uh, caps around here, no more rise. Petroleum increased 60s, had their peak in the 70s, 80s and then decreased again. Yeah, for power generation, uh, which fuel resource, which fuel source has provided most of the electricity in 1949? Uh, look, let's go to 1949. The highest line is coal already. So coal. Which energy source shows the largest decline since uh, the 1970s? 1970s. We are here. Which one goes down most from the 1970s? 
So we compare 1970s to 2011. We can see 1970s petroleum is one of the highest and at the end of the graph petroleum is the lowest so the correct answer should be D petroleum. A student wants to test how different types of flooring affect the motion of a toy car. Oh, that question does not relate to this graph. Okay, so different question. A student wants to test how different flooring affects the motion of a toy car. Which of the following would be best would be the best design of an experiment? So we want to test how different types of flooring affect the motion of a toy car. So the different type of flooring is our independent variable, that's what we change. The motion of the toy car is what we measure. And everything else should be constant, controlled variables. So have a look at the answers yourself. Pause the video and we will start the discussion now. Choose three cars with equal masses. Push cars down a ramp onto three different types of flooring. Observe the car that traveled the farthest on each type of flooring. Choose three cars with different masses. Allow cars to roll down a ramp on to three different types of flooring. Observe the car that traveled the farthest on each type of flooring. Choose three cars with equal masses. Allow cars to roll down a ramp onto three different types of flooring. Observe the distance traveled by each car on each type of flooring. Uh, choose three cars with different types of masses. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so uh, which ones can we definitely exclude? We just look at the first sentence. Choose three cars with equal masses. Choose three cars with different masses. Again, we are interested in the effect uh, of different types of flooring on the motion of the car. So that means the mass of the car should be a control variable. So we can immediately exclude B and D. So it's either A or C. What's different between A and C? Um, allows cars to roll down a ramp onto three different types of flooring or push cars down a ramp onto three different types of flooring. What's better? I think C is better. Allow them to roll down the ramp. If you push them, it's very unlikely you are able to push with the same strength every time. So that would be another factor that affects uh, the outcome of your experiment. Um, yeah. So just allowing them to roll down the ramp controls for the starting velocity. Pushing them changes the starting velocity every time. So the correct answer here is C. And yeah, that's it. Part two of our uh, GD3 practice test. That's the last part. Uh, two part video, two part screencast. Um, this was GD Live at PALS. I hope I could help you today again uh, with the preparation for your GD test. I hope I could uh, clarify some topics, something maybe like uh, balancing chemical equations or types of chemical reactions. Um, if you find these videos helpful, please consider to subscribe. Again, this helps us to reach more people who want to study for their GD tests. It's free, it doesn't cost anything, so please help us with your subscription. All right, have a great day, and I wish you all the best for your GD science test. Until next time.